Greetings, friends. In the mighty, miraculous, and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, we bring you greetings from the Christ Center Apostolic Ministries. For yours truly, Pastor Thomas D. Jordan is the pastor and the founder, and where the vision of our church is lead God's people from membership to relationship. There we are located, 5915 Bramble Avenue in the historic community of Madisonville. And again, the vision of our church is to lead God's people from membership to relationship. As you hear the words of the early, we like to refer to him, Reverend James Moore in the choir beneath the sound of his voice. For our relationship with the Lord is all the world to us. Praise the Lord again to everyone in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I, you know what? His name is Jesus to us. If you're Hebrew, you say Yeshua. And people argue, want to argue the point that if you call it his name Jesus, you're wrong. Well, number one, I'm not Hebrew. My native tongue is English. And I say Jesus in English. And every time I said Jesus in English, he heard me and responded to me. So if you want to say Yeshua, you, could, you, you have the right to do so if you want to say it in Hebrew. But I want to follow through. If you want to continue along with that trend of thought, then learn Hebrew and speak Hebrew exclusively. If that's the point you're trying to make, I just get that in. But we refer to him as Jesus and we were baptized in Jesus name. And we are saying praise the Lord in Jesus name to everybody. I'm going to get phone calls about that. I know I am. I know I am, but I think I proved the point. I'm not, my native tongue ain't Hebrew, it's English. If I was Hebrew, I'd say Yeshua, but I'm my name, but I'm speaking in English and translated into English. His name is Jesus. Glad to have everybody on the board again, the Christ Center Apostolic Ministries broadcast. If you haven't figured it out yet, we are a preacher of the gospel. And yes, we are trying to convert you. Amen. And want to see you saved and set free and delivered. Amen. And is every time is the right time to get saved, to be born again of water and spirit. And at the minimum of this broadcast, we always say we pray that you're watching, you're taking notes, and uh, you will follow along with us with your Bibles and have the spirit of the Bereans. One day, I, I keep saying I'm going to preach off that verse, but the people need to have the spirit of the Bereans that will not just swallow everything that the preacher is saying. And that includes me. But they will get their Bibles and they will follow along the scriptures and search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. So we thank God for being able to come to you by way of the uh, uh, Waycross and, and cable TV and, uh, and also by way of the World Wide Web. You see the uh, web address there at the bottom of your screen, waycross.tv slash V, is that V-O, V-O-D-P, yeah. amen, V-O-D-P. So we thank God for this venue. We are uh, we have already asked the Lord to, or blessings on our broadcast. We just want to get right back into the subject matter at hand. We've got a lot to deal with. We've already in, informed you. Uh, we, our services Sunday morning, get it out real quick. Services 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, 7 p.m. Bible class. And when you see this broadcast, you will see you have plenty of time to respond to the invitation to join us on Sunday, March the 13th. We're our guest speaker for that day, Sunday morning at 11 a.m., and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. on Sunday, March the 13th, will be the walking Bible himself and the talking encyclopedia, Johnny James. Elder Johnny James, one of our mentors in the gospel, we talk about him frequently. I told him when I called him, I said, man, we, we talk about you all the time. Keep name, dropping your name. You might as well show up so they can hear the real deal. Not Memorex, but hear it live. And so he consented to be with us on Sunday, the March 13th. And we invite you to come hear this man of a great God, living legend. 80 years old, going strong, and once you hear him, you will know why they call him the walking Bible. And he has not a, he's not a pastor of a church, he's an evangelist for the body of Christ, but he's sure enough has pastored a lot of pastors because of the word of God. All right, dealing with this topic, women in the church, women issue, dealing with 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. Again, the verses state, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to, unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. We have stated that if the traditional church interpretation holds true, then what this verse means is that women can't speak at all in the church and that women can't teach or preach at all in the church. If this traditional interpretation holds true, we've stated before that we've been to places where in a conjunction 
not only with this verse, but with the verses that we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 11 and 12, that uh, it, they, they, they apply it so much they don't even let women stand in the main podium on Sunday morning, even to give announcements, all right? But we believe and are convinced these verses are not banning women and prohibiting women to speak in a church. There's something deeper going on. For Paul, as we gave the context of the passage of Scripture, of this, of this passage of Scripture, um, Paul is dealing with tongues. He's dealing with prophecy. Then out of the blue, he deals with women. And the overall theme of the chapter is to deal with order in the church. Again, Paul abruptly and totally out of context dropped his teaching on spiritual gifts <coughs> and prophecy and tackled the questions of women being silent in the church. So here's some observations and interpretations we told we would, you would let you know on part two, and here's part two. If the passage in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35 is to be taken at face value and that all women are to remain silent, it contradicts what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 5 when he gave instructions for women praying and prophesying. Now, look, in theory, I guess you could prophesy and you could pray silent, but it doesn't appear that these women were doing that silent according to looking at the context in the church. They were doing something out loud, which was, you can't cause a disturbance being silent, I don't think, doing it out loud, all right? And he says, if they will learn anything, it means in this passage of 1 Corinthians 14, the fact that he says, if they will learn anything, it indicates that the women were not prohibited from learning. Hmm. And if they want information, they were to ask their husbands at home. We've already asked, who does a woman ask if she doesn't have a husband? The next very important question, which will begin to unlock these two verses, is this. Where in the law does it command a woman to be silent and commands her to be under obedience? Where in the law? That's the question on the floor. Does it command a woman to be silent and also commands her to be obedient? In the law. The response to that is don't look too hard and long. The law in the Bible doesn't say that. The examples of women speaking during the administration of the law are plenteous, but there are four in particular. Deborah who is a prophet, according to Judges 4 and 4, and also a general, judge of, J judge of Israel, 40 years. Hold up, hold up. The men, Josiah, sent them to check on the administration and the building of the, of the uh, temple. And he refurbished the temple. And upon them going to make sure the men were getting their just pay and their just due, <clears throat> there was a book found, book of the law found in the temple. They brought the book of the law, read it before Josiah. Josiah fell out weeping in repentance because he realized how far Israel was off on the interpret on the on what the scriptures required, what the law required, and he needed a word from the Lord. And with all the contemporaries available, the prophetic men available unto. Josiah and the people of Israel, they bypassed all those men and they went to a woman, a married woman at that name, Huldah. And Huldah sure did bring forth the word of God. And I didn't see them swallowing and, and disturbing her and, and disrupting her. Say, wait a minute, woman, we don't want your word. We want a man's word. They received her word. The word caused revival. Amen. They, they got back to doing what the word said. It was under the auspices of the woman. Zelophadad's daughters stand up for their rights to have the inheritance of their father because their father didn't have a male to inherit his stuff. But he had daughters. They spoke up in Miriam, Micah 6 and 4. Miriam sent by the Lord, and she did speak. Back in the day, I'm told, I'll tell you a Johnny James story. There used to be a minister, Bishop Johnson was his name. I forget what his first name was. And at the time, he was ministering in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And at the time, Elder James, I believe, was a student in, in Philadelphia. And he would listen to him on the script, on his radio. And Bishop Johnson made this statement and said, 
I will give anybody, he may have said $1,000. It was a big money amount, so we're going to use $1,000. If I have to correct it later, I will. But $1,000, I give any man $1,000. And he said, I'll show you any man $1,000. If he can show me anywhere in the Bible where God sent a woman. Elder James said he threw on his gym shoes. And he said he jogged anyway uh, three days a week. He said he jogged down at the church. He got the usher's attention. He said, Bishop Johnson and said on the radio, if he can, if any man, person can bring a, a verse of scripture to him in the Bible where God sent a woman, he would give him $1,000. He said, here's the man. I got the verse and I want my money in tens and twenties, please. The verse he had was Micah 6 and 4, where God said, I said, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Bishop Johnson heard him bring the scripture. Bishop Johnson said, I didn't mean that. He said, ain't that you said you meant. You said if any man can bring forth the scripture where God said he sent a woman and I got the scripture. And he backed out. They threw him out the church. He came back in on another exit and another entrance door. He said, you put your, your goons, put, your, put their hands on me again. He said, you're going to be talking to my lawyers in the morning. The Bible, women spoke in the Old Testament. So for the fact that this verse in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 said, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. As also saith the law, the law didn't say it. Well, pastor, what then, or what law then was Paul referring to? I'm glad you asked. The law that Paul was referring to was not the law contained in the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, but the expression as also saith the law refers to the oral law of the Jews now called the Talmud. It was the rabbinical tradition which Jesus often encountered in dealing with the scribes and Pharisees. <coughs> Excuse me. Question. Well, then, weren't the women disrupting service asking questions? It is difficult to recreate the setting of the Corinthian church when we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. But in we, we, it is, there is documentation. We do know that in the Hebrew temple and in the services for worship, men and women were separated by either an aisle or another level for women to sit at. They were segregated, men and women. It is an assumption that in this new thing that is called the church, seating arrangements were the same and that also the early Christians worshiped primarily in a synagogue or a temple. They didn't. They did not. They primarily worshiped in houses. There is also a question of the proper place of the punctuation in the text of 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 and 34. Notice this. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 and 34, in the King James Version, it reads, For God is not the author of confusion, comma, but of peace, comma, as in all the churches of the saints, period. Let your women keep silence in the churches, semi, semi, or colon. It is not permitted unto them to speak, semicolon, but they are commanded to be under obedience, comma, as also saith the law, period. Notice how it is rendered in the New International Version, the revered New International Version, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, period. As in all congregations of the saints, comma, women should remain silent in the churches, period. They are not allowed to speak, comma, but must be in submission as the law says. What is the difference? King James Version just says, let your women keep silence in the churches. It is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Before that it said, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. But the NIV says, as in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. Do you see the subtle difference? The NIV is just... The, the biasness of the translator in the NIV has made this an outright condemnation of women speaking in the churches when it doesn't read that way. Remember, remember, punctuation did not exist in the ancient Greek text. Punctuation is something that has been added to our versions, including chapters and verses. The placement of the period in the NIV changes the whole reading of the text and really makes this sound like a universal principle applied to women. You have to watch all translations and versions, even the revered NIV. Then lastly, this is the punchline here. A tiny Greek word makes all the difference. It is hard for me, I don't have to write it out for you, 
put a vision in your mind, the letter N, and the bottom, the, the, here we do an N, like so you can see it in your screen. And this side of the N comes down longer and it's got two what appear to be like vowel points above it. All right, that is a uh, symbol. And the symbol represents an emotional rebuttal by Paul. It is called by Greek scholars an expletive of disassociation. I said, man, I ain't come to study that hard. Well, we must study the Bible. Study to show thyself a prude unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The closest English equivalent in English would be, what? Nonsense. Or, no way. Paul uses it 14 times in 1 Corinthians. He uses it twice here in 1 Corinthians 14, 36. For he says, what? Came the word of God only from you? Or came it unto you only? Then he goes to say, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. It looks as if Paul wasn't agreeing with the Corinthians, but verses 30 and verse 34 and 35, he is quoting a slogan of theirs. Hmm. So if those are not his words, he's quoting their words back at them. Again, the quote is from rabbinical tradition, not the Bible. And then in response to what they said, he goes, what? Uh-uh. Hey, uh, Bible ain't said that. It, is, there's, there, it also appears in 1 Corinthians 1 and 13, where he goes, no way. Were you baptized into the name of Paul? 1 Corinthians 6 and 2, what? Do you know that the saints will judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, nonsense. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 16, no way. Do you not know that he who, he, he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? 1 Corinthians 7, 16, or what? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? 1 Corinthians 9 and 6, nonsense. Is it, is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? 1 Corinthians 9 and 7, no way. Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? 1 Corinthians 9 and 8, what? Doesn't the law say the same thing? 1 Corinthians 9 and 10, no way. Surely he says this is for us, doesn't he? 1 Corinthians 10, 22, nonsense. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two. 22, what? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? And then 1 Corinthians 14, 36, a nonsense. Did the word of God originate with you? Or 1 Corinthians 14 and 36, the, the latter clause, or are you, what? Are you the only people it has reached? What came the word of God, King James Version, what came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Or what came it unto you only? Or you can even say nonsense, came the word of God out from you. You understand the meaning? Again, he is responding to words they said. These are not Paul's words, because again, we have established the law doesn't teach such a thing. Again, he is quoting from rabbinical tradition, not the Bible. All right? In 1 Corinthians 14, another way to look at this, Paul commanded tongue speakers, verse 28, and prophets, verse 30, to be silent as well as it appears. We could say it appears in verse 34. So if you were saying that, he, well, well those, were not, those were Paul's words, he is not putting a universal principle applied to women being silent. If, if, if anything, another viable interpretation that that was some commotion going on with women, he was trying to put them be silent right now, but not totally silent, silent for all times in the churches. Or, of course, you could apply, then you would have to apply the same principle to tongue speakers and prophets, and they sure weren't being kept silent perpetually because he says in verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. But traditionally, understand this, at least in Pentecostal assemblies, <laughs> it has only been applied as an absolute principle to women and not to the prophets or tongue speakers. Again, the key concept 
and principle to be applied from this passage is order in worship, not a denial of speaking at all for tongue speakers, prophets, or women. He's establishing order in the church. And two ways to look at it, a temporary again, the straight in order if you would like to look at it, if you, if you want to accept that these are Paul's words, verses 34 and 35, but the real, real clue and the real ex sound exegesis for this verse leads us to conclude, again, the expletive, what, what did I say? The expletive of disassociation, Greek scholars call it. He's going, what? Responding to something they said. They said women couldn't speak in a church and it had to be silent for all times and had to go ask their husbands. He's going, nonsense, huh? Came the word of God out from you or what? Or came it unto you only. And so he's setting order. Everything must be done decently in order. That's the key to the text. For women, <laughs> for tongue speakers, and for prophesying. And don't forget the point we established earlier. Prophesying in this passage, amen, is a presentation or ministering of the word of God. And there are some who teach in the church that women can be prophets, but they can't be teachers and or preachers thinking that prophesying is just some gibberish, something spontaneous. Look, if you look at the way prophecy appears in this chapter, it appears that there's something systematically thought out, systematically delivered to the person so they can hear and understand what thus saith the Lord. And we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 and 5, that women were praying and prophesying, so he could not have been denying women the place to prophesy or to, pre or, or to speak in the church. You got to put all the scriptures together. You got, put, you got to look at every verse of scripture in the Bible that's dealing with women and compare scripture with scripture and come up with a sound interpretation. Because if you come up with the wrong interpretation, you have now disenfranchised over half the church and a majority of the folks sitting in our pews in the church. You go to any church on Sunday morning, they're full of women. Yeah. Now, some churches are blessed to have it even, and maybe a predominance, more predominance of men. God bless you, but that ain't been my experience. And look, a woman is going to get saved before a man, hands down, I'm telling you, a woman going to get saved faster than a man ever will. Man going to go down with the Titanic and trying to prove how big and bad he is. But a woman gonna call for help, and she gonna call on the name of the Lord, name of Aunt Jemima, name of, she gonna call on the name of somebody, and women will encounter the Lord usually first before man. That's been my experience. You have the right to argue and disagree. So it comes in that passage of scripture where it says, talking to the, treating the woman like the weaker vessel. The woman is not weaker spiritually. What that verse is talking about on a norm, like you deal with Proverbs, Proverbs, the Proverbs are basic principles, and then there's some exceptions to the rule, but those are basic norms, but there are some exceptions to the rules, all right? The norm is most men are stronger than women, but I know some women that can out bench press <laughs> men, all right? So there are some exceptions to the rules. So it's talking about norms, and it's talking about more physical strength. So brothers, you treat her like a lady, like the temptations. Treat her like a lady. You go out. Some of you brothers don't stop doing that. You go, y'all got married now. You got her. They're going to stop treating her like a lady. When you go out, open the door for her. Amen. You gather by the hand. Treat her like a lady. Help her down those steps. I see my pastor talking to the brothers of the church. You better help those sisters down those steps. When they fall, you're going to feel bad about it. Help. Treat her like a lady. Treat her as the weaker vessel in terms of of a body mass and strength, a normal strength. Treat her like the feminine queen, the, the beauty queen that she is. But a lot of women are stronger mentally. A lot of men, women are stronger spiritually than men and prove they ain't the weaker vessel necessarily spiritually or mentally. You look at aptitude tests, a lot of guys, a lot of kids, especially at a young age, girls be picking up quicker than men. Potty training, they say it's quicker for <laughs> girls pick up quicker. Then the boys, I don't know, because the boys be drawing, not drawing a line. All right, but you can understand the point. So we cannot disenfranchise over half or three quarters of the body of Christ by a nonsensical interpretation of a verse 
when the verse ain't teaching what it appears to teach. As my friend Johnny James would say, almost right is always wrong. How much time we got, Brother Randy? Three minutes. Three minutes. Amen. Time for us to wrap up. All right. We have established that 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12 are not, haven't, there's not a ban on women teaching or use, we say usurping authority over man. If you want to just use it as a, as we understand the English language, God ain't for nobody, no one usurping authority if it's taking over authority out of a man or a woman. All right. The authority comes from the word of God. Authority is not resonant in a gender. It comes from the word of God. The word of God is the authority. And I want the word. I don't care who the vehicle, who the vehicle is or the vessel is. Just give me the word. And if we see here in 1 Corinthians 14, it is not, a, not an outright man or woman saying anything in the church. Amen. I don't know some women ain't going to have that anyway. Amen. If I'm sowing my money in here, I got to have something to say. Amen. About where my money's going and how the tithes are being paid. And no foolishness going on here, but it is not a ban. It is a response of Paul to some rabbinical tradition that was being trying, being propagated in the church of Corinth, and he is setting order in the church. All right, if you have any questions or comments, March the hallelujah. Mar Mar March 13th, praise God. March 13th, the walking Bible will be at Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries. There it is on the screen, 5915 Bramall Avenue in the historic community of Madisonville. March 13th, Sunday morning at 11 and Sunday evening at 6 p.m., the walking Bible itself, the talking encyclopedia, my friend, my mentor in the gospel, one of my fathers in the gospel, precious man of God, 80 years old, going strong, Elder Johnny James will be with us that Sunday. We invite you to be out with us and enjoy the word of God. And again, if you have any questions or comments about anything that we shared on this broadcast, you can address your cards and letters to Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries, 5915 Bramble Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio. 45227 and contact us by phone at 527-4567. We'll be blessed to have you. And in memory always of my father in the gospel, Bishop Nichols, we sign off this broadcast by saying, God bless you and heaven smile upon you is our prayer. Relationship with you. <laughs> Greetings, friends, in the mighty, miraculous, and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. We bring you greetings from the Christ Center Apostolic Ministries, located at 5915 Bramble Avenue in the historic community of Madisonville. But yours truly, Pastor Thomas D. Jordan, is the pastor and the founder where the vision of our church is to lead God's people from membership to relationship as you hear the words of the early, as we like to call him, Reverend James Moore, again, for our relationship with the Lord is all the world to us. Praise the Lord again to everybody in that electrical region in a digital region we call television land and also coming to you by way of the World Wide Web. We say praise the Lord in Jesus' name to everybody. Welcome to the Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries broadcast. And uh, we are uh, here um, for no other reason to uplift the name of Jesus and to glorify his name and edify his people. And as we like to get started on every television broadcast, we let you know up front that yes, this is a church TV broadcast. We are using the Bible. And yes, we are, when all is said and done, trying to convert you, proselytize you, evangelize you, witness to you, and all the above and everything else you want to use to describe with the purpose and ultimate purpose and name of this broadcast is and is truly to see men and women, boys and girls from all walks of life, all ages come to know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their Savior, to be born again according to the Scriptures. And at a minimum, we pray as you're watching this broadcast, as you're taking notes and you're making your personal assessments, taking notes, following along with us in your Bibles, that you will uh, search the Scriptures daily, as we like to say, have the Spirit 
of the Bereans in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, verse number 11, as they search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Follow all behind the preacher, test the word of God that is given on this broadcast and test it by these scriptures, the scriptures, which are the acid test of anything that men or women or whoever is ministering or preaching or teaching is saying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And before we move any further, we want to just ask Father, Lord God, your blessings upon this broadcast. Thank you for your uh, grace and mercy. And again, your traveling mercies, Lord God, as we have been on the highways and Lord God and protecting our family and keeping our family. And thank you again for this tremendous opportunity to bring your word to the masses, Lord God, by way of television, a way of the world wide web. We pray, Lord, most fervently, Lord God, that some soul would come to know you and to be saved and set free from the clutches of sin and to know, Father, the hour that we're living in, that you are coming just like you said you would. I pray, Lord God, a blessing on our city right now and around the country, especially in this time of the summer, Lord God, and bless our elderly, Lord God, keep them and bless them, Lord God, that there be no uh, deaths due to the heat, Lord God. Uh, we pray that they will be ministered to effectively. And we pray, Lord God, for the young people, Lord God, the young men and women, Lord God, in our streets of Cincinnati and around the tri-state area, Lord God. Bloodshed, Father, stem the tide. Bloodshed, let a revival sweep, cause revival to sweep through this city, Lord God. Bless our president, our leadership in this country. Bless our leadership in our churches, Lord God, across the city, across the country and worldwide, Lord God. Raise up godly leadership that will hold to the standard of righteousness and holiness, Father. And it again is our pleasure, Lord God, to serve you. We love you unequivocally, Father. In Jesus' name, bless our producer and director, Brother Vanderveer, Lord God. Thank you for his labor. And Lord God, for this city of the last 30 years, Lord God. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank God uh, uh, again for the opportunity. And we extend to you a uh, cordial invitation to worship with us at Christ Centered Apostolic Ministries, 5915 Bramble Avenue, Sunday morning service at 11 a.m., and then Wednesday Bible class at 7 p.m. are our two main services through the week. Sunday morning, 11 a.m., Wednesday morning, uh, Wednesday evening Bible class at 7 p.m. And also you can tune, uh, give a little uh, promotion, you can tune in also to, to us on Wednesday afternoons for the radio broadcast at 1320 WCVG, 1320 WCVG, 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoons. Also for radio broadcast, so we've got your radio, got your TV, got your internet. All mediums trying to get the word out about Jesus, who is the Christ. And so we pick up on our studies in which we have embarked upon several weeks ago. And we are dealing with the issue of the return of Jesus Christ. Why Christ must return. Talking about Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus Christos, Jesus the Christ. Why Christ must return and as a little help. Uh, with the, uh, the subject, we're utilizing uh, uh, material from the Bible expositor himself, John MacArthur, out of California, a book called Truth Matters, landmark chapters from the teaching ministry of John MacArthur, given out on his 35th anniversary of ministry and pastoring for that church, uh, 1969 to 2004, a broad parameter of, uh, of um, uh, teaching. During that, during that course of time. Praise God. But the, there are nine reasons why Christ must return uh, that are given. We are dealing with all of those. We have dealt with the fact that Christ must return because the promise of God demands it. The teaching of Christ demands it. The testimony of the Holy Spirit demands it. Hallelujah. All nine points. The program for the church demands it. The corruption in the world demands it. The future of Israel demands it, the vindication of Christ demands it, the destruction of Satan demands it, and the hope of the saints demand it. All uh, the return of Jesus Christ. And just in case there is a uh, uh, some amnesia setting in for what our point of departure was, for what our point of departure was in Second Peter chapter 3, we will reread that again. Um, beloved, verse 1, I now write to you, reading out of the New King James Version, the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. We need to be reminded 
that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering to us, to war us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is coming back just like he said he would. So why Christ must return? I really said in a nutshell we're going to give you the we're going to give you the the lp version over the course of these broadcasts we're giving you the lp version but really the 45 and even the 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 the, the 45 version has been given to you in a nutshell he is coming back because he said he would and i said lp in 45 and people are looking at me like i'm crazy don't know what an lp and a 45, if we talking about vinyl now, an old record player, <coughs> the old Victrola. <laughs> uh, so the LP, the long playing record, was it the 33? That was a long. And then the 45 was a small one. It had the little thing, little little uh, device that you stick on the middle of the turntable so you could. Some people don't remember the 78. <laughs> the 78. <laughs> the 78. All right, we're talking about, now we're in the, in the land of CDs and iPods and, and, uh, and, and, and IMAX and all that stuff, but but we gave you the, the 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 we're giving you the LP, the long playing version. But but in in a nutshell, he is coming back because the Bible said he would. The Bible said he would. All right. So when we picked up, we're picking up from where we left off. The testimony of the Holy Spirit demands it because God cannot lie, according to Titus chapter one and verse number two. So His promise guarantees Christ's return. Jesus is truth incarnate. John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't believe Jesus and you don't believe the Bible, then you really don't have anything. And we don't have a point of departure in which we can come to and agree on to discuss the matter at hand. So if you don't believe Jesus and believe the word because Jesus said it, then we don't have anything. And you can go on your way and I can go on my way. But if you believe the Bible, and I pray you do, we got a point in which we can converse. So, Jesus is truth incarnate. His teaching also infallibly confirms the fact of the second coming. The Holy Spirit, who is called the Spirit of Truth, according to John chapter 14 and 17, and John 15 and 26, also testifies of the second coming of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote these words under the Holy Spirit's inspiration in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, where Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you, for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you should that you, so that you come short and no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he shall be revealed in the sky. Hallelujah. When he shall crack through the clouds. Amen. And return with the saints in glory. So the Holy Spirit, who authored the Bible, is testifying about the return of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He, he confirmed the same promise through several of the New Testament authors. Paul wrote, our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 and 20. He encouraged the Colossians with this when he says, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3 and 4. And he had much to say about the Lord's return in his epistles 
to the Thessalonians. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up or raptured, snatched up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. First Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17. The Holy Spirit further confirmed the promise of Christ's return through the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Hallelujah. New King James Version, he will appear a second time. First time he came back to deal with sin and to become the offering for sin, thereby he went to the cross. The second time he comes, as I like to say, it would be like Flip Wilson and here comes the judge. They slapped him the first time. They spit on him the first time. They put a crown of thorns on his head the first time. They pierced him in his side the first time. They assassinated him and sent him to a unrighteous death on the cross, lied on him in court the first time. But the second time, here comes the judge. He's going to be coming to judge, amen, and to collect his people from all four corners of the earth. And we eagerly wait for him. Listen, I am, as I lead this broadcast, I am married to the best cook in the world. She got to be the top. I love my mama, but I got to put my wife at the top. But she is the best cook in the world. My wife, Sister Jacqueline Marie Valentine Jordan, I told you, I got preachers that come in town just to eat her cooking. And I, after I leave here, I am eagerly waiting to go home and eat some of her cooking. And I don't care what it is, my wife can just look at the box and make something to presto and it come out tasting good. I am eagerly waiting to go home and eat her cooking. Well, you know what? The thing beyond eagerly waiting to eat my wife's cooking, I am e eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus Christ because he came, he is coming back just like he said he would and the Holy Spirit who authored the scriptures said he would come back. And you will find the promise reiterated also in the epistle of James. James chapter five, Verses 7 and 8, hope you have your Bibles. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, somebody just said, there, Breach, I caught you. That was written a long time ago. And James said, the coming of the Lord is at hand. All right. We have already established in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. Verse number 9, 2 Peter 3 and 9. But is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the verse before that says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that what the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. People trying to prognosticate on exactly and pinpoint the day when the Lord shall return, get into biblical, try to get into biblical mathematics and start dating stuff. And when they do that, I ask them what calendar are they using? Are you using the Gregorian calendar? Are you using a Ju Julian calendar? Are you using a Jewish calendar? Or are you using a calendar that was in existence before the turn of the 20th century, the calendar was changed. There have been zoodapdillion, I'm exaggerating a little bit, there have been tons of calendar changes and calendars, especially pertaining to North America and the United States of America. What calendar are you using? So people try to date stuff and they try to get into equations like a thousand years here and a thousand years there. Listen, the Bible is not saying one day in biblical numerology equals a thousand years or is not saying a thousand years equals one day. They talk about seven days of a, of a time period or a day of represents a time period. All it is saying is, and we said this before, we say it for emphasis and for your remembrance. All it is saying is this, 
that God is not in time. Time is in God. So when a day passes, so when a thousand years passes in our minds, a thousand years, a millennium, if you please, a millennium, in God in the in the in God's mind or in the in the in light of eternity, it's just like one day passing with God. All right. So when James says in James chapter five, verses seven and eight, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And people say, "Uh uh-huh. See, he said the coming of the Lord is at hand and it hasn't happened yet. It in God's mind and in, in, in eternity, in light of eternity, his coming is at hand. Hallelujah. Because a thousand years is as a day with him. So the Lord, so the Lord, from the moment he ascended, and promised, had promised he was coming back. Didn't you read in Acts chapter 1, verse number verse number 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all, and all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Then it says, verse 9, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, look at the Bible, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. All right. From the moment he ascended, they have been awaiting for him to descend back to the earth and to come back. Hallelujah. And there has been a pregnant pause, so to speak, in the time frame, according to man. There has been a delay. Why has there been a delay? The delay is to give millions and thousands a chance to come to the Lord. But guarantee you, he is coming back. We like to say again, the return of the Lord is not necessarily immediate, meaning I'm not guaranteeing He's coming back in the next 30 seconds. And I'm not guaranteeing he's coming back in 2009. All right. I don't know. He could come back in the next 30 seconds. He could come back in the next minute, next hour. He could come back in 2010 or 2009. But we do know this. It is imminent. He is definitely coming back. Listen, we are in summer. And should the Lord tarry, continue to delay his coming, just like it is done since the beginning of time behind summer, fall's coming. And if we keep living, fall is going to be taken over by winter. And thank God winter doesn't always last. After winter comes spring and the cycle repeats itself. Summer, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring. It's coming with just as sure as the seasons will change. Jesus is coming back just like he said he would. And the Holy Spirit testifies to it. The testimony of the Holy Spirit demands it. Peter penned similar inspired promises. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. First Peter 1 13, be sober and rest your hope. Listen to this, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, it means when the Lord will be revealed out of heaven, when he shall make his return back, he shall be unveiled. The book of Revelation, really the unveiling or the manifestation of Jesus Christ. So whenever you see the term, the revelation of Jesus Christ in the Bible, it is talking about his coming. And another in 1 Peter 5 and 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Can you can you get the picture now? The Bible is saying that Jesus is coming back. The Spirit also confirmed this truth through the Apostle John. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2, one of the most blessed promises in Scripture. And I am reading Reverend MacArthur's words verbatim. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, 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 we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So again and again, the Holy Spirit testifies through the writers of the New Testament that Christ is coming 
a second time. Don't listen to the fool who is trying to persuade you that this is nonsense, that this is hogwash, that this is baloney, and just go on, que sera, sera, what will be, shall be, that the earth was created by a big bang, and we're just a mass of molecules rolling into space. I'm here to tell you, and I don't want, because I don't want you to be left behind. I want to be like the movie, get on the bus. The bus is coming, and it's a design, and, it, and it's no excuse for you not to be on the bus, backtrack thousands of years back to Noah. Noah's trying to tell them it's going to rain. They didn't believe him, but all they had to do was get on the ark. I'm trying to tell you, I don't want you to be left. Get on the ark. The storm is coming. It's going to rain, but you don't have to get left behind. All you have to do is believe it and receive it. He's coming a second time. His testimony through the pens of the men whom he employed as instruments to write the inspired word of God as a third infallible witness to that of the fact that the Father has testified to it and the Father incarnated in the Son. The promise of God demands it. The teaching of Christ demands it. And now the Holy Spirit is still testifying that Jesus is coming back. Then next after that, Jesus has got to return because the program for the church demands it. God's got a program. God, God is not willy-nilly. God is not doing things haphazard. God has a plan and a design for the world individually and collectively. I interject this thought. My niece, God bless her, asked me one time that she had heard something on TV. You got to watch out what you're hearing on TV, including this preacher. You got to watch out. got to check it out. And it was a question about the will of God that there really isn't an individual plan for people is really just a general plan of God. And I said, there is an individual plan, but the individual plan that God has for us conforms to his overall plan for the world. He had an individual plan for Moses and a purpose for Moses. He had an individual plan for Abraham. He had an individual plan for David. He had an individual plan for Joseph. He had an individual plan for Paul or a purpose, if you will, but the individual purpose or plan fit into the broad context of his great plan for the world. Listen, if it's not, if it's not edifying the body of Christ and edifying the world at large, and if it's not glorifying God, it ain't God's plan. But if it's God's plan, it will fit in the context of his broader plan, which he has for the world. And, we, and if you know where the world is headed, you'd be, punching, getting your ticket, and trying to get out of here, because we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, hallelujah, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with the great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, and it ain't about you believing it. This isn't about you believing it or not believing it. It's going to happen because the Bible said so, but the program of the church demands it. The program of the church de demands it. God's plan for the church also demands the return of Christ. He is currently visiting the Gentiles to take out a name, take out of them a people for his name according to Acts 5, chapter 15 and verse 14. And he is gathering his elect into one great body, the church, and the church's role is to be like a pure bride for God's own son, ready to be presented to him at his second coming. We'll pick up more on that. God's plan for the church, but don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't get like the fool and don't be hoodwinked. Don't be bamboozled. Don't be run amok. Don't be taken for, like I said, don't let them play the three card molly on you with your soul. All you got to do is believe and receive. And I give you the words of the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. If you believe the response and the action behind the belief, and coupled with repentance, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. And God has promised he will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Friends, if you have heard anything on this broadcast that you have questions about or concerns, you can address your cards to the address on the screen, 5915 Bramble Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45227. You see the number 527-4567. 
And again, take time and drop us a line. And until the next broadcast, may God bless you and heaven smile upon you is our prayer. Sopranos by yourself. Music, go out by yourself.